There we go. Hello, welcome to this video. So today I am doing a live and I'm just going to be answering a whole bunch of different questions that I received about gut health. What is the role of food intolerance in IBS? How does how does IBS cause food intolerance? Well, it's quite a, quite a difficult question because the thing is, and, and this is this is quite a challenging a challenging thing. The diagnosis IBS is literally the most useless diagnosis you could receive. IBS basically just means they've done like a load of different tests, or maybe they haven't. Sometimes they just give this diagnosis out because they they, they just want to. But they basically usually go through a load of different tests. And they're like, we don't know what's wrong. So you have IBS. There you go. We'll give you this. We'll give you this this label, this diagnostic, because you don't fit into any of these other boxes. So this is usually a diagnosis of exclusion, of elimination. So you've tried, they've tried fitting you into all of these other boxes and you don't fit. So when you're saying, what is the role of food intolerance in IBS? It's tricky because IBS is such a broad thing, you know? I, you can get IBS with constipation and IBS with diarrhea, and they're like, how, I don't even see how they can be connect, like the, how they can even be put into the same diagnostic box because they're so far apart. They're complete different extremes. So that's that's that, that's a challenge. You know, how am I going to be able to answer that question when IBS is such a loose diagnosis? So it's kind of hard. Food intolerance. I would say the thing you, that you need to understand about food intolerance is. A concept called digestive capacity. So if you've lost the ability to digest the food, you don't you, you can't digest it anymore and it's gonna give you problems. But that doesn't mean that the food is bad, it just means your digestive system is weakened and we need to figure out where it's weak, support it, strengthen it, build it back up, and then it can tolerate these foods again. I can personally eat almost whatever I want with almost limited quantity. I'm still working on like nuts, seeds, beans, legumes, like these things take a little bit more time to be able to have high doses of because they, they take time, they're hard to digest. But you need to build your digestive function back up so that you can incorporate these foods again. So we've got a live question from Ryan. I'm really excited to see you here, Ryan. Nice to have you. So he says, constipation, not li eliminating regularly. Help. So really good question. First of all, I would direct you towards one of the videos that I've created recently called constipation and how to solve it. So I've done a whole other video that's like a step-by-step -step guide of different things you can implement to resolve constipation. So definitely check that video out. It's like 40 minutes. It's a way more in-depth guide. But I'm gonna give you the like a brief summary. So constipation on the, on the physical side comes down to three primary factors. You've got the composition of the microbiome, you've got fiber, and it's not what you think. It's not what you think about fiber, and I'll elaborate on that, and it's hydration. And it's also not what you think about hydration too. So with regards to the microbiome, if you, your, your, your stool, your, when you go to the toilet, what comes out, your, your poop, is basically 80% living and dead bacteria. So if you have an imbalance in your microbiome, that's gonna directly affect the composition of your stool. And if you have a deficiency of probiotics, you're gonna have a deficiency of stool, which looks like constipation. So that's that's the first point you need to cover. So in this case, a good high strength probiotic can be really helpful. You just, Ryan says he's going to go and check that video. There's links to a probiotic in that video. So check that out. That'll be really helpful. Second point is fiber. So eating more insoluble fiber causes constipation. So the types of fiber that the doctors actually prescribe you. So the 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 fibro gel, the, the these different types of um, what's that one? This is the psyllium husk, these are, these are really abrasive, aggressive fibers, and they bulk your stool out a lot, but they actually exacerbate constipation. And there's, there's studies for this. You can go on Google and type correlation between constipation and fiber intake. And the more constipated you are, the more fiber intake you probably have. And with these individuals, as you lower the amount of fiber that they eat, the constipation gets better. So insoluble fiber is not what you want to be eating. It's going to make constipation worse. You want it to be increasing soluble fiber. The difference being these are fibers that dissolve in liquids. So the best way to do this, like the, the best and most easy way to do this is to incorporate juicing in your diet. So if you can juice up to a liter of juice every single day, and you combine this with probiotics, I, I pretty much guarantee that for 80 to 90% of people, you won't have constipation anymore because you're providing two of those elements. You're also resolving the, the hydration element too, which is not just about drink more water, it's about drink more water with the appropriate electrolyte balance. 
And when you just drink water, especially when you're not thirsty, that's just gonna dehydrate you. That's not gonna help, that's just gonna flush out your electrolytes, which is gonna cause worse constipation because your body is now trying to take every single little electrolyte that it can get its hands on out of your digestive system. So you don't have any potassium or magnesium left in your gut, which is what helps it to retain the fluid in the gut, which makes the stools soft. So the, 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 the formula is basically a good high strength probiotic combined with juicing is usually enough to resolve constipation in about 80% of people. But they've got a video about that, so go and take a look, Ryan, I think you'll, you'll find that really, really helpful. Let me know if you have any more questions. So, on to the next one. I got another one here that says IBSD. So this is the IBS on the other end of the spectrum, this is diarrhea. I also have another video about this, so I strongly suggest that you check that out, whoever asked this question. So, I have a video, you can, for any of my videos, you can literally just Go on YouTube, type my name followed by the topic that you want. So you could go on YouTube and type William Dickinson, how to fix constipation, and you'll get a video. Or William Dickinson, how to fix diarrhea, and you'll get a video. There'll be a video there. So you just type my name and any topic that you want covered about the gut, and I'll probably have a video about it. So definitely check that out. Long story short, you've probably got diarrhea because there's something in your gut that your body doesn't want there to be in your gut. This could be a food, a food allergy, this could be a type of bacteria or a bacterial toxin that's being produced. There's something in your gut that it wants to flush out. And currently I've just covered the physical, you know, there's a spiritual, there's an emotional, there's a mental level to these things as well. Constipation can be a sign of not being able to let things go. Diarrhea can be a, con uh, a, a symbol of like flightiness or like being stuck in a fight or flight kind of nervous system state. Constipation is more associated with freeze. So there are, there are levels of complexity to this, but I'm kind of a bit more focused on the physical because it's, it's easier to be more general about physical stuff because the emotional stuff is always very personalized. So it's kind of harder to talk about in a, in a Q and A kind of set. So we have another question here. Uh, I have a burning stomach all day. What, what can I do about it? So this, Burning stomach, this is probably like a gastritis kind of situation. So gastritis is interesting because you've probably got a damaged mucosal lining in the stomach. And this can be tricky because this is usually paired with, so gastritis is usually paired with low levels of stomach acid. And you, at first you might think, well, that doesn't make any sense. My stomach is burning. It feels like it's really acidic. But the thing is, when the stomach is appropriately producing the right level of, of mucus, you've got acid in your stomach that's being produced that is strong enough to dissolve metal and bone. Like this is, this, the strength of this acid is absolutely unbelievable. You know, you can dissolve bone and, and metal in the acid of your stomach. So it's not that the acid level is, is, is too high. It's, it's, it's very rarely, almost never the case. What's actually happening is the lining that protects the stomach is, is eroded, is, is damaged for some reason, and the, the acid has to lower its levels. Of, it's not as strong as it usually is because the stomach can't handle it. But your stomach's smart. It's not gonna produce so much acid that you dissolve your own stomach. It knows if the stomach lining is damaged and it's gonna produce an associated or appropriately less acid. But this is bad because we need stomach acid to be able to digest our food. So we need to ask the question and go to the root cause of, okay, what is causing the erosion or damage of the stomach lining? Often this can be, so this goes hand in hand with the low acid levels, we can have our stomach overpopulated with pathogenic organisms. So things like H. pylori or different types of candida, they can grow in the stomach and it's not that they're bad themselves, it's that they're an adaptive response for something. And I see this very commonly is, is associated with exposures to toxins in the environment. So the most common ones I see here are, are mold and mycotoxins and heavy metals like mercury in the mouth. If you've got mercury fillings or you're exposed to mold and mycotoxins, there's, there's literally almost nothing you're gonna do that's gonna make much difference to a gastritis, dyspepsia, stomach acid problem, other than, but first of all, you have, to, you have to fix that. So you have to stop being exposed to mold and mycotoxins and you need to get this mercury removed from your mouth because these organisms are present in the stomach to try and bind to these toxins for you to stop you absorbing this toxicity. It's an adaptive response. And if you try and kill the H. pylori, you try and kill the candida in a situation like this, you're actually just gonna feel worse as a consequence because you're destroying your body's adaptive, adaptive response. And that's just gonna make, you feel, that's gonna make you feel worse. So we have another question here. Burning slash painful upper back. Where are you feeling this? And give, give, me, give me more detail, like is this Digestive, is this connected to, it? but tell me more about this so I can help, help you understand. And Nicole also says, my stomach lining is floating in my 
esophagus, they said. So th this sounds like erosion. This sounds like erosion of your of your of your, of your stomach lining. It's 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 weakened for some reason, and the acid is being able to erode past the thick mucosal layer that protects it, and it's actually eroding the lining of the stomach itself, which is really bad because it, it does cause a lot of damage. It can cause stomach ulcers. It predisposes you to things like stomach cancer. It's going to reduce the absorption and uptake of different nutrients that you have in your diet. You're not going to break foods down properly, which is going to predispose you to things like SIBO and SIFO. So it's really important that you try and figure out the root cause of, of why that is happening in your case. Let me know if you have any questions. So next question. Uh, candida overgrowth, pretty, pretty broad question, not even really a question, just, just a statement, candida overgrowth. So as I was saying with candida in the stomach, when, in this gastritis presentation, candida is almost always an adaptive response in some way. So you're, uh, I see most people doing like gut tests, stool tests, organic acids tests. They see like, oh, I've got this organism as out, this one is too high, this one is too low. And the initial instinct is, okay, I just need to figure out how to get these levels back to normal. But it's a bit more complex than that because we're not just trying to get, I mean, we are trying to get, we are going to try and get those levels back into a normal range because that's a normal healthy range. But the question we have to ask is, what in the environment causes, caused these things and is continuing to cause these things to stay out of balance? So if you've got a candida overgrowth, and especially if you've done different types of probiotics and you've taken antimicrobial herbs or antifungal herbs, and you've you've tried maybe even prescription antifungals or things like this and it always comes back, that, that means that the, the candida overgrowth is an adaptive response. It's happening to help your body adapt and survive in its current situation. So we have to ask the question, what is it adapting to? How is the candida an intelligent response? Why is it actually a good thing that the candida is overgrowing? Because it is, if it keeps happening over and over again, even when you're treating it, and it keeps overgrowing, then it's happening for a reason. It's not random, it's not, it's, it's very unlikely that it's just that your body has a weak immune system and it just can't keep it in balance. If it's happening like this after multiple rounds of treatment, then there's, it's, an, it's an adaptive response. And I find this is most often the case with most dysbiotic presentations. And like the gut instinct is like, oh, it's high on my test, I need to kill it. Oh, this organism's high on my test. Oh, I have H. pylori, I need to kill it. It's like killing, killing the organism is not the first step. You need to ask the question, why did it overgrow in the first place? And is it actually overgrowing in a pathogenic way or is it an adaptive response to something in my environment? Because if you have, this, this goes even further, this can go for like Lyme, this can go for EBV, this can go for like parasites and really more complex infections. If it's an adaptive response and you try to kill it, you're going to feel worse. And this isn't a Herxheimer reaction in this case. This is you stopping your body from healing itself. And obviously you feel worse when you do that. So just going in and killing the organism because it's high on a test or seeing you've got like thrush, a fungal presentation on your toenails and in your mouth. And then you just, okay, I have candida. I'm just going to try and kill it. And then you try to kill it and you feel worse. Your body is a biofeedback machine. It's giving you input about the level of health that you have all the time with your symptoms. And if your symptoms get worse, if you feel worse, you probably don't want to do what you're doing because that's your body trying to tell you, you're not making me healthier, you're making me sicker. So this isn't, uh, this is, there, there's a fine line here because obviously Herxheimer reactions do exist. But even in that case, so even if this is a pathogenic organism, even if you have a yeast overgrowth, even if you have H. pylori or Lyme or EBV, and then you do try to kill it, if it makes you feel bad, either your body's probably not strong enough for you to be doing that right now, so focus on doing something else, or you're killing it too fast and pushing your body past its limit, past its upper limit for how much it's able to process, like toxicity-wise, is actually slowing your recovery. So stop doing it that way. It doesn't help. It really doesn't help. Your body is what is going to heal you, not the protocol that you're doing, not the diet that you're eating. It all comes from your body. So you have to make sure that the things that you're doing are actually working with the body to cultivate a state of health and listen to your body, listen to your symptoms as it tells you, like literally in the moment, whether what you're doing is helpful or harmful and, and trust it because it's really smarter than you are. This is something that I say with my clients. We're going to set up a roadmap of, of scientifically, like what makes sense. You know, oh, you have low stomach acid, let's support it. Oh, you've got low digestive enzymes, let's support it. Oh, you're missing these organisms on your test. 
let's supply them. Oh, this sounds like a root cause, let's try and address that. But then we always start with this refined plan, but then once you get into it, like, crazy stuff happens, you know? The healing journey is like this, you know? It's all wibbly wobbly, it doesn't go in a straight line. Things are gonna come out, the body's gonna say yes, I like this, the body's gonna say no, I don't like that, stop doing it. And you listen, you don't just stick to the thing that you've been told is the right thing. You listen to your body because your body has the answer. Your body knows what it's doing because it's what is giving you the level of health that you currently have. And even if you're not as healthy as you want to be, you're more healthy than you are sick. Otherwise you'd be dead. So you are actually in a state of health. And we just need to figure out how we can amplify that, how we can give the body what it needs to create more health instead of pushing it making it feeling really bad, giving yourself even worse symptoms and saying, I'm suffering, so I know it's working. That's a terrible mindset. You need to change that, it doesn't help. A little bit of a rant there, but next question. If you have any questions, let me know in the chat. I'd love to answer your questions over these. I think your questions, it'd be good to get some nicer engagement going. So let me know. Okay, Maureen. Nice to, nice to have you here, Maureen. Maureen says, oxalates in our foods and how it affects our body. So. Again, this is kind of like what I was just saying with, with the microbiome. It's not oxalates themselves that are bad. If your body is in a, in, a, in a weakened metabolic state, it may be susceptible to oxalate toxicity. So this can manifest a couple of ways. This can look like, uh, common ways are things like joint pain, kidney stones. Um, I'd say they're probably the most common, but oxalates can, oxalate sensitivity can manifest in a, in a lot of different symptoms. But the thing is, it's not just the oxalate themselves. First of all, most of the people that have an oxalate problem, it's not actually coming from oxalates in the foods that they're eating. The majority of the oxalate that they're being exposed to is coming from oxalate that's being produced inside their own digestive system. So this is something that happened for me, and this is something that I've, I've seen with a couple of other people as well. And you'll, you'll know, you'll, you'll have a pretty good clue if this is happening with you, especially if you do an organic acids urine test, and you have high levels of oxalate and arabinose. What can happen is you can be colonized by fungus or by different types of mold, and then they can actually eat food that you aren't digesting properly inside your body. So if you're eating like loads of carbs, but you don't have the ability to digest them, so you're eating like lots of starch or like rice, potatoes, but your body's lost the ability to digest them, these these fungus, these yeasts, they eat the they, they eat these carbs and they produce these these organic acid metabolites like oxalate, oxalic acid, and arabinose. And if you've got both of these highs on your both of these high on your organic acid urine test, there's a good likelihood you've got fungal dysbiosis and maybe you've been colonized by mold. And in this case, whether you eat a high whether you're eating a high oxalate diet or a low oxalate diet, it doesn't really make a difference because you've got so much oxalate being produced inside your own digestive system. It, 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 it's like a drop in the ocean, it's, it's tiny, it's nothing. So in this case, what you need to do is change the microflora composition, change what's happening in your digestive system. You can, you can even, act, I actually saw this the other day, you can actually now buy a probiotic of a certain type of organism called Oxalobacter, which is a, a probiotic species that likes to break down oxalate. You can now buy this as a probiotic, which is really cool. So getting that back into your microflora can, can help with this, that's, that's one example. But inside the actual body itself, oxalate toxicity is, you wanna be more mindful of the mineral balance in your body. So if your body has the appropriate mineral balance, so the calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and the other like trace minerals and the other, the other metabolic processes that are happening in your body, like your body can bind oxalate to magnesium, so you can have magnesium oxalate, and it's water soluble, and it'll just pass out of your body, you'll just wee it out, and it's, it's fine. But what happens is, if you don't have enough like magnesium, for example, the oxalate binds with calcium. And when it binds with calcium, it creates this insoluble salt. So it actually forms a crystal. And if you look at, if you go on Google and type oxalate, calcium oxalate crystals, like these crystals are like little daggers, you know, these are like shards of glass. And they're really sharp, they're really painful. And if they're getting embedded in your, in your joints, in your kidneys, like it, it really hurts, like it hurts a lot. And you might think, okay, this oxalates is bad. It's like, no, it's not. It's that your body doesn't have the right metabolic 
capacity to process oxalates anymore. And there's a lot that goes into this. But one of the biggest things is, what is the oxalate having to bind to? If it's binding to calcium, because you've got, you're taking a calcium supplement, you don't have high enough vitamin D, you don't have vitamin K2, the calcium isn't getting put into the bones, into the teeth, into the right places in the body. And that calcium instead is binding with oxalate, creating oxalate crystal, calcium oxalate crystals, then you have a recipe for disaster. So it's not just about avoiding oxalate, it's about understanding the full metabolic process of what's happening inside the body with regards to oxalates. Brett, nice to have you Brett. So he has a question, acid reflux from eating eggs. So I guess you're eating eggs and you're getting acid reflux. This could be an indicator of intolerance and this might mean your body just doesn't like them right now. I would say, this is a really common one, this is one of the reasons that eggs are the most, the most I would say eggs are the most common food intolerance that I see. And unfortunately, a lot of vaccines are grown on egg whites. So when your body is injected with, with the vaccine, it, mount, it triggers a, an immune response to everything that's inside that vaccine. So it triggers an immune response to the, the viral components what, with, the, what, with whatever the vaccine was, but it also triggers an immune reaction to the egg white, the proteins inside the egg white. So then your body sees your body sees this and it's like, whoa, this is dangerous and triggers, a, an, a, triggers an appropriate response because it's like, wow, this is dangerous. So in this case, maybe your body's like, wow, this is a dangerous protein. Let's make loads of acid and just throw acid all over it and try and destroy it because it's dangerous. Could be that. What I would suggest you do is try having just egg whites and just egg yolk and see if there's a difference there. I find most people that don't, that have a problem with eggs, they only have a problem with the white, and not with the yolk. Let me know. Have, do you have a problem with both? Is it one or the other? Have you ever tried? It's definitely worth experimenting with. Heather says, what are some general ways you suggest navigating heavy, heavy, heavy metals in the body? I know it is individual. So the first thing that I would, I would always think about with regards to heavy metals is the gut. So and it's pretty appropriate that you ask this in a, in a gut health Q&A. So the, the amount of metal that you absorb from the food that you eat is so much higher if you have increased levels of intestinal permeability. So when you, say you eat some tuna for example, so tuna obviously is a healthy food but it does have higher levels of mercury contamination than, than it used to like 100 years ago because there's just more mercury in the ocean now and it accumulates in the larger carnivorous fish. So tuna has a higher level of, of mercury. Actually very interestingly, tuna have actually developed a defensive mechanism. I believe they have significantly increased levels of selenomethionine which is a mercury uh, binder. They have like, I think it was like 250% increase in the last 100 years or something, and that protects them from mercury exposure. So while they're being exposed to mercury, they're fine. Like it doesn't cause toxicity for them because their bodies are adapted to it. So pretty, pretty cool to see that. But I would, I would always be thinking, we have to look at the health of the gut because the gut is where most of your toxicity comes from and it's where most of your toxicity leaves your body. So if you have increased permeability in the gut lining, not only are you going to be absorbing more, but you're also going to be reabsorbing more when your body's trying to get rid of it. So if you have reduced gut permeability, like a healthy person, and you've got a very good microflora, the amount of mercury that you absorb when you, when you consume some in your diet is like 8,000 times less either 8,000 times or 8,000%. Either way, it's like an astronomically larger, like large reduction in the amount that you absorb. And this is true of what you eat and what you're expelling as well. So your body expels heavy metals through your bile. So if you have increased permeability or you're missing the right flora that you need to approach these bile acids that are full of this toxicity, decouple the toxin from them, reabsorb the bile acid back into your body and excrete the toxin in your stool. If you're missing the right flora to do that, you're gonna be Retoxifying re re yourself with all of the all the toxicity that your that your body's trying to eliminate naturally. So I would say, do, like the bait, like get your gut in a really good place. You know, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna try doing any of the more complicated things like chelation or any like specific supplements like the that little, I think it's like a colloidal spray. That I think it's called TRS or any of the like chelation protocols, your gut, you want your gut to be in a, in a place where it's just solid, you know, you want your gut to be super strong. That's definitely the best place to start. And then I would say after that, it is very individual. So more of a case by case basis, but you're never gonna go wrong with making your gut really strong. It's always a good place to start. And Heather also says, what are your thoughts on iron toxicity in the body due to overload, overly fortified foods and mineral imbalance, but anemia shown in the blood? Yeah, this is really interesting. And this is something I was talking about recently with one of my clients with B12. So if you take 
B12 injections, but they're cyanocobalamin, you're going to have high, but your body's in a, in a, in a somewhat compromised metabolic state. You might show as having really high levels on test, but your body's actually in a state of deficiency because it doesn't have the ability to make the, the B12 a bioavailable form. It can't afford to take the cyanide molecule off and detox that molecule and use the B12. And the same can be happening with iron. So the type of iron that you're getting in your food, in, in fortified foods, is literally like iron ore. Like you could like go to a go to an iron quarry, and like mine some iron out with a pickaxe and then eat it. And that's the same thing that's happening when you eat like fortified cornflakes. So it, it's useless to your body. It's completely useless. It's like saying you're gonna take a calcium supplement and then go in and eat in some calcium carbonate, which is like a chalk. You like go to the supermarket and buy some white chalk and eat it and say, oh, this is good, it's high in calcium. It is, but your body can't do anything with it. It's completely useless. So again, the gut is really important here because your microflora can turn some of this sort of inner inorganic like useless minerals into bioavailable minerals. They can take the calcium carbonate, they can take the cyanocobalamin, they can take the, the, the mineral iron and turn these into more bioavailable forms of these nutrients. So again, I would say look in the gut. You know, for, if, you, if you're having toxicity in the blood because you have high levels, probably don't eat the fortified foods because that, that's obviously not helping you and your body's not in a state where it can, can handle that. And again, that's not a never eat it ever again for the rest of your life. It's maybe wait until your gut is a bit stronger so that it's able to convert some of that inorganic iron into some organic iron and your body can actually use it. And if you have anemia shown in the blood, there are other elements that are important in the anemia presentation. So you've got B12, you've got folate and folic acid, you've got, yeah, iron is one as well. There's more than just iron that goes into anemia. So look into these, these, other, these other things that can cause the, the anemia. And the, the B12 is really appropriate because you can have high B12 levels, but if you've been taking cyanocobalamin, you can have high levels and your body can be operating on what's called a functional deficiency, where even though you have high levels in the blood, the cells that need it are actually starving of it because your body doesn't have the resources to take the cyanide molecule off of the, off of the B12. So in this case, you would want to be supplementing with B12 even though you had high levels because your body is actually starving for it. And the only reason you have high levels in the blood is your body's basically keeping this reserve of non-bioavailable B12 in case it's a life or death situation and it really needs it. And it's going to really prioritize the energy that it needs to, pro to use to take that toxic cyanide molecule off and detoxify that. So look at the other elements of, of anemia and see if there's if there's anything, any, anything else in the presentation that, that, that needs to be covered. Erica says, my B12 is super low at 180. So you're definitely gonna wanna look at um, maybe taking a B12 supplement. I just did a video, uh, I did two videos in the last week, both about B12, one about everything you need to know about B12 and how to supplement it. And then another one of me actually doing a B12 injection at home. I would definitely encourage you to go and check those videos out. They're not available on YouTube just yet. They'll be out there with there in two weeks and you can just go, go on YouTube and type William Dickinson B12, or you can just go on my Facebook and just scroll back through the, through the thing and, and, and find it in there. It was in the last week, so you should be able to find that quite easily. Okay, uh, another question about Candida. How to treat a rash being caused by Candida? So, so first of all, it's important to understand that you cannot have a dysbiosis in any area of your body if you don't have it in your gut first. So if you have candida on your skin or in your mouth or in your vagina or like anywhere, if you have, if you have a skin problem anywhere connected to a dysbiotic organism, you have to have a dysbiosis in your gut. It's just not possible. Your gut seeds the microflora for the rest of your body. So all of the micro, so you actually have a microflora everywhere. You have it especially anywhere on your body that's wet. So that's like your eyes, your nose, your mouth, inside your ears, your like your respiratory system. So like your lungs, your digestive system, all the way through your gut, your bladder, your 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 kidneys. Like this is all wet. This is all covered in a mucosa, and this has a much higher uh, number of, of organisms, but you have microflora everywhere. You have it on your liver, you have it in your heart, you have a microflora in your brain, you have a microflora on your skin, you have it everywhere. But the health, the overall health of your microbiome is determined by the health of the microbiome in your digestive system. So if you have 
a, a skin problem that's associated with, with, with yeast or candida, you definitely have to look in the gut first. So as long as you're working on the gut at the same time, then we can look at what we can do to focus on helping the skin problem. So this could actually look like using a topical probiotic. I've actually seen really good results where someone was having a, it was someone's, someone's child, I think it was the son, I can't remember, it was either staph or strep. So this is a, this is a very common uh, skin, I wouldn't say it's common, but you, you see it quite a lot. Well, I see it quite a lot anyway. <laughs> it's a, a, a skin condition where there's a presence of a, a certain organism and it's causing the skin to have a, a, a rash. And we went at this by using a probiotic, a, a probiotic topically. So we were taking a high strength probiotic, and you could do this with like a fermented food as well, you could do this with kefir or something like that. So we took the high strength probiotic, mixed it in some, in some water, and applied it to the, to the area of the face where the infection was present. And it resolved it, just like that. And yes, obviously we're working on the gut and balancing the microflora in the whole body at the same time, but you can do this topically as well, and it can provide a lot of immediate relief. I've seen results of people improving a yeast infection in the vagina by using a, a tampon soaked in kefir and leaving that in overnight, and it, amazing results. Day after, gone, no problems anymore. I've seen lots of different improvements in different infect, so it's like skin problems or different problems associated with, I don't even think infection is the right word because infection is quite strong. I would, I would call it more of a dysbiosis presentation, more of an imbalance. And if you just restore that balance, the presentation of the, the, the dysbiosis disappears and the associated symptoms also disappear. So skin problem goes away. Uh, yeast infection disappears. Uh, I've seen this in the sinuses as well, having um, congested sinuses, uh, adding some probiotics to a saline rinse and then, and then doing the saline rinse through the nose, resolve the, the sinus issues. So it's about restoring the appropriate microflora to the area of resolving the symptom. Okay, my throat's getting a bit sore, so I think we'll probably be finishing this up soon. So let me know if you have any questions in the chat so I can make sure I prioritize answering your questions. We have a question here. What strains of probiotic help to clear E. coli? So this is a really interesting one because you can actually take E. coli to clear E. coli. So this, is, this, is, this kind of ties back in with what I was saying just a second ago about seeing something high on a lab test and thinking, I just need to kill it. If you have a high level of E. coli, you have to ask the question why, you know? And if you're having symptoms that kind of indicate post-infectious IBS, so it's like you had food, food poisoning and then your body like never recovered. So the food poisoning triggered an imbalance in the microflora that it never was it never able to recover from. We can actually, and this usually happens because a pathogenic strain of E. coli gets into the gut and the gut doesn't have the healthy strains of E. coli. So these other ones are like, cool, I'm gonna move in. And then it causes the diarrhea and the food poisoning. And then it's like, cool, I'm gonna live in now. So I'm, I'm here, I'm living here, so, so deal with it. And this is because you don't have enough of the right type of E. coli. So E. coli is just like, you've got lots of different types of E. coli. You've got healthy, beneficial probiotics and also harmful um, pathogens. So just seeing high E. coli on a, on a test isn't really very helpful because you need to look at it with, with the symptoms in mind. So I've actually seen people that have high E. coli find re resolution from the symptoms by taking a probiotic E. coli strain. And you can, you can look this up, you can go on Google, I believe it's called the Nissle strain, N-I-S-S-L-E. This was uh, invented by a German doctor in one of the world wars and if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, he was using it to treat people that had dysentery, was actually, which was actually uh, a microflora imbalance. And he was giving them this probiotic E. coli. So probiotic E. coli, you know, the, the E. coli that you've been told causes food poisoning, the E. coli that you've been told is bad, the E. coli that if it's high on a test, you just want to kill it. This German doctor in one of the world wars was using it as a probiotic to cure people's dysentery and it really worked. So you can Google that, it's the Nissle strain, N-I-S-S-L-E. I believe you can still buy it as a probiotic today. Actually, I know you can because one of my clients used it. Okay, two more questions. If you have a question, now is your time to ask it. I'd love to help you figure out your health problems. Let me know what, what questions you need answered. So, Ah, oh, this is a cool one. Can you talk more about the link between the gut microbiome and the brain? So on a really super basic level, 
we can just look at there's one molecule that, that really stands out as being a really good example to talk about, that's serotonin. So everybody knows that serotonin is important. There's like, it's the happy, the happy one, the one that makes you happy. You know, if you have low serotonin, you're gonna be depressed. And this is why, if you have depression, you should take an SSRI, a Prozac. It's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So that's actually not true. They don't actually know why Prozac works. They have no idea, but that's what they, 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 they guess it does. But nobody actually knows for sure. So that, that's fun. Um, but yeah, so serotonin, 90% of the serotonin in your body is actually made in your gut, not in your brain. And we all know that serotonin is connected to a, a good mood. So if you have an imbalance in your microflora and you don't have the right bacteria that produce the serotonin for you, then you're not gonna feel very happy. This is just one example. This is just, this is just one molecule. This is, this is one neurotransmitter. There are so many different things that the body relies on the gut for. It's not just neurotransmitters like serotonin. It's, it's, it's vitamins. Like a really good example is folate, folic acid, folate. So if you look at how much a person, how much, how much folate a person's body needs in a day and look at how much folate is available in foods, it's, it's, and it's literally almost impossible to get enough folate from your diet as a healthy person, even if you eat in like a super clean, high folate, like folate rich food diet, it's almost impossible to get enough folate. And this is because your gut flora actually makes a lot of folate for you. So it takes fibrous compounds, it takes different types of, prebi of prebiotics, the food that bacteria like to eat, and it creates folate for you. And this is just one example, but this is true of all B vitamins. You can think of the B, you can literally take the word B and change it for bacteria. All the B vitamins are produced, they're, they're basically postbiotics. They're substances that are produced by bacteria. So like thiamine, riboflavin, folate, B12. These are all things that are produced by bacteria. I don't think they're called B vitamins because they're bacteria vitamins, but it fits really nicely. So if it sticks, then let's, let's use it. So all of these different B vitamins, you can get from your gut. If you have the right gut flora, you can produce loads of different types of B vitamins in your gut. And these affect metabolic function, these affect your mood. If anybody has MTHFR or other types of methylation problems, and you've ever tried to optimize your dosage of things like folate and methyl B12 and all these things, you'll know it really affects your mood. Like your mood's up and then down, and then you're disassociated, and then you're manic, and then you've got all this stuff in between. Now you're depressed, now you're anxious. And this is because the, it's messing with your methylation cycle. But the reason that you have these problems is because your microbiome has become so imbalanced and so weak that it's not able to provide your body this on-demand supply of, of vitamins as and when it needs it. And this is true of so many different things. This is so you, with the, what Heather was saying earlier, you eat the fortified foods, you get the, you get the iron, the mineral iron, and your, your body's like, oh, we need some iron. So your microflora is like, okay, we can help out. So we'll take this mineral iron, we'll break it down, we'll make it more bioavailable. Here you go, you can have that now. And it gives it to you. There's this constant communication between your body and your microflora. And they know exactly what your body's needs are at any moment. And they're doing, they're doing what they can to produce those things for you. So there's such a deep connection here. And when we understand, like your gut is called the second brain. And that's for a good reason, because it is providing you so much of what you need to operate your other brain. So the link between the gut and the brain is, I think that is it, like, it's kind of like a hot topic right now, but I feel like we're scratching the tip of an iceberg. You know, there's gonna be so much more to this. We're gonna see so much more over the next few years. And I'm really excited to, to see where this goes. So that is the final question for today's video. If you're watching this afterwards and you've watched all the way to the end, you watched this whole thing and you have a question, just leave it as a comment. I'll come back and I'll answer it. Make sure you tag me. So at William Dickinson, tag me so that I make sure I, so make sure it gives me a notification. If you just write a comment, I get so many notifications now that I just, sometimes I just don't even receive them. Facebook just doesn't even give them to me. But if you tag me on anything, if you have a question at my name, send your question and it will make sure it gives me a notification. So if, you have, if you've watched all the way to the end and you still have a question, make sure you ask because, well, you deserve to have a question answered if you watched all the way to the end. So let me know if you have any questions. I hope you found this really helpful and I look forward to doing this again. We only got through like 
maybe 15 different questions. I still have 35 left. So if you liked it, let me know. I'll do another one some other day. So that's everything for me today. See you soon. Bye-bye.